Okay, I think we can get going now. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's SEDS Online seminar. My name is Chelsea Peterson. And before we get started today, I just want to thank the International Association of Sedimentologists, the IAS, who sponsor us um, here at SEDS Online to produce all of this wonderful content for you, um, both uh, via things like these webinars, as well as all of the content that we have on our website. So make sure and check it all out. Um, it's all free of charge, of course, and let us know if there's something that you're looking for um, that maybe we don't offer or you just can't find. So um, feel free to always uh, shout out to us. We have things like recorded lectures, all of the past lectures. So if you're unable to make one, you can always go back and take a look at those. We have virtual field trips, a lot of different learning tools um, and things for the classroom. So make sure and, and yeah, check out that website. Today, we're really excited to have Cynthia Nava Fernandez, who is a recent graduate from the Institute for Geology, Mineralogy and Geophysics at the Ruhr University Bochum in Germany. And that's where I met Cynthia, and I'm really excited to have her on today. She received her bachelor's from the Autonomous Metropolitan University and her master's from the Center of Scientific Investigation and Superior Education in Ensenada. She then moved over to Bochum, Germany to pursue the study of cave systems. Cynthia is, um, hopefully it's okay that I'm giving this plug, but Cynthia is currently looking for postdoc positions. So if you have any leads that you think would be a good fit, um, please feel free to reach out to her and send her um, any information on those. Today she's going to discuss how ENSO and other climate uh, variability is recorded in some speleothem deposits. And with that, Cynthia, thank you again for joining us and I will give you the mic. Thank you, Chelsea. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am pleased to be here and share with you the research I performed during my PhD in Bochum University under the supervisor of uh, Dr. Sebastian Breitenbach and Dr. Adrian Immenhauser. During my research, I explored the connection between caves and the Pacific Ocean. So the, stru um, the structure of this talk starts with a brief reminder of the atmospheric conditions over the tropical Pacific, a general context of the speleothems as uh, paleoclimate archives, and two examples of uh, this uh, science. So the first one will be um, an example of how the environmental signals are transferred in, into a cave system. And the second one will be a paleoclimate reconstruction. And finally, some conclusions. So um, the Pacific Ocean is the biggest ocean on Earth. And um, uh, because it's great extension, it has the ability to store a great amount of energy from the sun, especially in the tropics, this energy is stored and distributed to a higher latitudes. For this reason, the tropical Pacific plays um, play a major role on the um, regulation of climate or on Earth. So here, uh, in this map, this map is representing the conditions over the tropical Pacific. So you can see these yellow arrows that represent the direction of the trade winds. And these blue shadows are two belts of convective rainfall. The first one is the intertropical convergence zone, which is an horizontal belt of convection at 10 degree north. And the second one is this um, diagonal uh, belt that extends from the west to the south, uh, from the equator to the southwest. Um, these two belts of rainfall move to the north in the summer winter and moves to the south during in the summer in the austral summer. And they represent the first source of seasonal variability for this South Pacific area. And they have a great impact on the life of the Pacific communities. At interannual scale, there is another climate feature, which is El Niño Southern Oscillation, in short, ENSO. By definition, ENSO is a fluctuation um, 
in winds and sea surface temperatures that consist in a warm phase called El Niño and in a cold phase called La Niña. Because this is a fluctuation between warm and cold conditions, it is important to know what are the normal conditions over the tropical Pacific. In normal conditions, the trade winds blow from east to west along the equator. This air movement pushes the sea surface warm waters uh, over the Indonesia region, while off of the coast of Ecuador and Peru, uh, cold water from the deep comes to the surface. And this explains the temperate uh, climate in this region and the warm and rainy weather over Indonesia region. During La Niña events, sorry, during La Niña events, the trade winds are stronger than normal and the thermocline in the east moves up even further, um, which um, uh, in, so which causes that in the West Pacific, a uh, warm pool is uh, its form over this region. But all is different during El Niño events. When it occurs, the trade winds are weak or stop blowing, and the warm waters that usually are over the Indonesia regions move to the Eastern Pacific, bringing anomalous warm and rainy conditions over this region. The oscillation between these warm and cold uh, conditions has a frequency of two to eight years. As you can see on this record of the last 150 years, and because ENSO is uh, atmospheric and ocean couplet uh, system, it has the ability to impact the global climate. <clears throat> Also, the ecosystems, agriculture, fisheries, water resources, and not just in the tropics, but also in remote regions in higher latitudes. So, this, the long term characterization of this phenomena is extremely important for, uh, for the society, for policy makers, climatologists, and also for the improvement of the weather forecast. Mm, well, nowadays we are able to measure the environmental conditions using technology, for example, these meteorological, meteorological stations that can record a um, series of temperature, rainfall, with spin, with speed, sorry, etc. But unfortunately, these records don't go beyond 100 years into the past. And in order to know how the climate has changed in longer time periods, we uh, look at the geological records, which are also called paleoclimate archives. For example, um, like sediment cores, marine sediment cores, uh, coral fossils, tree rings, ice cores, and speleothems that are cave deposits. Um, for in and um, from these paleoclimate archives, we use proxies, which are an indirect representations of environmental variables. For example, here I'm showing you a um, marine sediment core that was uh, recovered from the peninsula de Yucatan in Mexico. And this marine sediment core is a paleoclimate archive. The proxy here is the, gra the grain size that indicates changes on sedimentation. And you can see here in the middle, this sandy layer indicates um, it was deposited during the um, impact of the meteorite that according with today's view was, um, was associated with the extinction of the dinosaurs. So, in my project, I work with speleothems as a paleoclimate archives. Um, speleothems are secondary <clears throat> carbonate deposits that include stalactite, stalagmites, flowstones, among others. And in the last two decades, stalagmites um, have become one of the most reliable paleoclimate archives because they present a simple stratigraphy. They can be precisely datable and they contain a large number of proxies. 
all of these features are given by the spelled informations that is this spelled information starts when the rain falls and it is mixed with the co2 in the soil this um, forms a slightly acidic solution that is going to infiltrate and dissolve the calcium carbonate bedrock producing a saturated uh, calcium bicarbonate solution that when this solution reaches the cave atmosphere it's um, the CO2 and water are taken off and a secondary calcium carbonate is precipitated in, cal in crystal forms and it forms these layers. Now please uh, let's focus on this uh, calcium carbonate molecule for, because it's from here where we are going to extract the the uh, proxy um, the environmental proxies for example some trace elements such magnesium strontium or uranium can substitute calcium in the calcium carbonate molecule we can also uh, look at carbon and oxygen isotopes and variations on these um, proxies are interpreted as changes on climate for the, the correct interpretation of these proxies depends on the identification of its sources and the mechanisms of incorporations. Here are some examples of these mechanisms. Uh, it can be atmospheric, rainfall response, soil dynamics, karst processes, cave process and cave processes. In order uh, so in order to contribute to ENSO and paleoclimate knowledge, my research, the research, ah, sorry, the objectives of my research were to test the sensitivity of Waipuna Cave to ENSO, to reconstruct ENSO past ENSO variability and explore the links between ENSO and rainfall seasonality. And for that, we have chose two interesting sites that are highly influenced by ENSO dynamics. The first site was Waipuna Cave, which is located in Waitumo region in New Zealand, in the North Island of New Zealand. And the second site was New Island, which is located at 19 degrees um, south. During El Niño events, these both sites receive less rainfall. And during La Niña events, Mm, La, Niña, La Niña brings more rainfall. So here, um, for the first study site, um, I'm showing you a picture of the cave. This is the main chamber and here we are collecting drip water samples and measuring some uh, physical chemical variables of the drip waters. Uh, Waipuna Cave is influenced by the westerlies during the winter. And in this uh, picture, you can see the surface above the cave, which is an outcrop of limestone. During this cave monitoring program, we measure rainfall above the cave, air temperature in the surface and inside the cave, uh, air CO2, we measure the drip rates from different drip sites and from these drip waters we measure temperature, pH, electrical conductivity and also we took some samples to be analyzed and measure the magnesium and strontium concentrations and some stable isotopes. So the main results the, now I'm going to show you the main results of this monitoring study. This plot uh, represents the response of Waipuna Cave to rainfall events. Each panel is um, a different drip site. So the x-axis is the time, the blue line is the accumulated rainfall amount, the red line is the drip rate, and as you can see, all of the all of this tree, this uh, bold line vary in a similar way, but they have different times of response. Based on these results, three infiltration pathways were identified. 
The first one is the fastest, and it is a fracture, fracture flow with, has a res, that has a response of five days. The second um, identify uh, infiltration pathways. Pathway is combined flow that has a response of af after 18 days. And the fastest is the seepage flow af that responds to the rainfall after 24 days. Now I uh, will show you some of the geochemical results. Mm. The next variable that we measure um, was the geochemistry of the waters. This plot shows the isotopic composition of the rainwater and it is represented by these blue triangles. The Waipuna drip uh, drip waters are represented by these pink um, dots and also we have we take we took some samples of a uh, stream that is inside the cave and it is and they are these green diamonds and you, and you can see that all the drip waters of Waipuna cave fall in the mean value of the rain above the cave and this um, this means that uh, the isotopic signal of the rainwater is transferred into the cave, but it is mixed on the epicarst. Therefore, the delta eighteen values that, if if we use a delta eighteen values from a stalagmite that has been fed by these drip sites, will be useful for paleoclimate reconstruction of multi annual multi-annual scale, but not for seasonal scale. But for uh, to represent seasonal changes, we have all, another good indicator, with, which is the magnesium-calcium ratios. Um, um, in this plot, we have the x, the x-axis, which is the time. Uh, the blue bars are the rainfall amount. And the orange lines are the magnesium calcium ratios. And you can see they uh, are, the magnesium calcium ratios are high during the dry season and low during the wet season. And this is because during the dry season, the epicars is less water filled and prior, prior calcite precipitation promotes the increase of magnesium calcium reach into the infiltrating solution. So we can conclude from here that magnesium calcium ratio in this cave system at seasonal scale is a good indicator of, um, of hydrology. Another parameter that we measure on this cave monitoring program was the cave ventilation. And for that, we use loggers that record daily air temperatures inside the cave, which is uh, this plot on red. And also um, surface air temperatures, which is this pink uh, plot. And the difference of the, the cave temperature and the surface temperature is expressed on this plot here. And uh, so, this difference on, on cave and surface temperatures tell us about cave ventilation patterns that are controlled by seasonal changes. For example, during winter from April to October, the cave air is warmer than the surface. And along with these differences of air density, the cave um, the cave ventilation is enhanced. In contrast to the summer when the air on the surface is warmer than the air in the cave and this uh, causes a reduced ventilation. We also find found that the CO2 levels are higher on under reduced ventilation conditions and lower during enhanced ventilation conditions. This um, 
So the take home message of this Waipuna study is that Waipuna cave has a fast response from days to weeks to infiltration events that the drip waters uh, Delta 18 reflect the main rain on, rainfall signal. <clears throat> Magnesium calcium from the drip rates reflects a seasonal prior calcite precipitation and dry and wet conditions. And we see that cave ventilation is driven by seasonal changes. So in, uh, in order to know past ENSO variability in a longer period of time. I use, I work with a stalagmite from New Island. So New Island, as I <clears throat> said before, it's located just right in the middle of the Pacific. It's highly influenced by ENSO. And um, here are some pictures of this island. This island is a carbonate platform and its bedrock contains a lot of caves. So the wet season in New Island is from November to April and the dry season is from May to October. Now I got this, from this island, I got this uh, beautiful stalagmite, which is called 130, C132. And it is, this stalagmite is 43 centimeters long. It started to grow 5,400 years before the present and stopped growing 5,400 5, years before the present. You can see these were, uh, these, these lines represent the tracks where I took samples for uranium thorium dating for stable isotopes analysis. I also perform some image processing for lamina counting and for the analysis of the trace elements we use laser ablation ICPMS technique. Now based on eight uranium thorium dates was possible to it was possible to constrain a precise a precise age deep uh, model, which is represented in this plot on the right. Mm, the most stri striking feature of this stalagmite is that it presents an alternation between clear and dark laminas. We have named the clear laminas as pale porous calcite or PC, PPC, and these laminas um, are deposited during the wet season. The dark laminas, we call it dark dense calcite, DDC, and these were deposited during the dry season. The differences of this uh, lamina deposition uh, are determined by the calcite saturation, which is higher during the wet season and lower in the dry season. Throughout optical observation of this uh, lamina, lamina, of these laminas, we observe the size and the shape of the crystal. And we define that the PPC lamina contains columnar microcrystalline calcite, which is intercalated with elongated uh, pores spaces, and that the dark lamina are columnar com compact fabrics. We also can observe some uh, fluorescence that could be indicated, indicating organic matter presence. Another interesting analysis is the elemental mapping that allows to identify where the elements such as magnesium, phosphorus, sulfur and strontium are located on the laminas and this helps us to associate the concentration of these elements with environmental changes. Now, having applied our age model to all of these um, measurements of elements and isotopes, we got this uh, really nice time series 
high resolution time series that show seasonal hydrological changes that are associated to the South Pacific Convergence Zone. So we can see some um, physical proxies which are ray scale, the strontium, the delta 18, delta C13, zinc, and also we have calculated the growth rate of the stalagmite. All of these proxies give us information about the seasonal changes on rainfall on the island. Now, on the search for ENSO signal, we have applied wavelet analysis on so on these proxies, and the, and the, so this is one of one plot resulting of this wavelet analysis, and it can be interpreted as follow. So on the x-axis we have the time. The y-axis represent the periodicities found on the record, and these uh, bubbles delineated by this uh, black line represent the periodicities that are statistic statistically significant. And as you can see, most of them are concentrated in a band of two to eight years. So these results, so this is, um, this wavelet is from the grayscale time series, but we also have performed in other proxies, which are not that, um, not very present, but we also find some um, periodicities in this ENSO band. So these results suggest that ENSO was present uh, what that ENSO was active during this time period. And the take home message from New Island is that uh, the stalagmite, the proxies from this stalagmite are good on the on recording seasonal changes of the South Pacific Convergence Zone. And this, this stalagmite presents, represent a continuous ENSO record from the tropical Pacific for this period, which was um, the mid-Holocene. And um, with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And that's all. Super, thank you so much, Cynthia, for that great talk. Um, we are now open for questions. So you can please type your questions into the chat and I will read them out to Cynthia um, as we move along. In the meantime, um, I'm going to get to a couple questions. Uh, Cynthia, so tell me one thing that you weren't able to do that you would have loved to do. Like, which proxy would you add to your stalagmite record in particular? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you got to actually analyze quite a bit of a bit of proxies, um, but would it be to have you know? higher resolution measurements for some of the things or a completely different proxy? Mm. Um, so I would like to have measure organic matter on the lamina mm -hmm. and see uh, and to look for a proxy that actually represents organic matter and associated to and associate this organic matter presence with um, rainfall or, or dry seasons. Okay. So um, I know you weren't, you know, you didn't have all the time in the world, but you do have some fluorescence data from some thin sections, right, within your stalagmite. So yes. that might be something that we could, um, uh, that you could look into is pairing that fluorescence imaging data, right, with some of your um, your stable isotope proxies? Yes, I think I can use the, uh, to li link the information I see on the fluorescence with some elements and, and see if there is any relation. That would be great because that would be a confirmation of this organic matter presence on the lamina. Yeah, absolutely. I know that's um, sort of in in the next steps for you, right? Um, the next data set of, of tying 
things like fluorescence and um you know sort of the petrography of of the stalagmite to those different measurements that you already have so it's a big task but um but a very cool one so you have some comments in the chat. Um, John says, thank you for the insightful talk. And he has to leave for another meeting, unfortunately. Um, Hanan says, excellent work, Cynthia. Can you elaborate about the hiatuses um, and elemental mapping? Yes, yeah. Um, can you see this, this slide? Yes. Yeah, so these uh, thin sections correspond to, to the uh, bottom part of the stalagmite where we find a hiatus. So the, older, the oldest age is um, uh, 6,400 years before the present and it's just above this hiatus because uh, below the hiatus, the age of the stalagmite is, I think, is um, 69,000 years before the present. So we think that this, um, the island is, uh, so there are a lot of earthquakes on the island that can change the infiltration pathways or broke the stalagmite at some points. Actually, this stalagmite was found broke on the floor. Um, so um, we infer that this hiatus is found because something physical happened on, on the cave. And so this is the only one hiatus we found. I don't, I don't know if I'm... Yes. So um, I think what you're trying to get at is that, you know, physical conditions change those infiltration pathways, as you mentioned, and therefore sort of stop the growth of the astalagmite. Is that correct? Yes, yes. More mm -hmm. or less. I mean, we probably you could get more detailed than I, but just to sort of sum it up for our, for our audience. Yes, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you have a date just below the hiatus and just above the hiatus. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And it sounds like that was a hiatus of something like 60,000 years ish. Yes, yes. That's, yeah, that's quite a long time. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the region is tecto tectonically very active. Yes, there. Um... I don't, I don't know how often, but it's very active. And there are okay. um, also the, in, the island is often impacted by <clears throat> cyclones, storms. And because some of the caves on the island are open caves, they can easily be impacted by these uh, uh, movements. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, if there's anybody else in the audience that has any questions, feel free to type them now. Um, in the meantime, I will thank Cynthia again uh, so much for coming and giving us that online webinar today. We were so happy to have you. And please remember everybody out there that this will be our last seminar until September. We will break next month for the IS annual meeting and um, for the summer months after that. So we. Hopefully we'll be seeing a lot of you in Dubrovnik for the IS meeting. And if not, good luck for all of the summer field work and all of the great things to come. Thank you so much.